Hi guys. Thank you for joining. This is Essence of Life. And today we're talking about near-death experiences. I'm Amanda Armagast. I'm Dr. Abbasi for Essence and we have a special guest. Please introduce yourself. I'm MK Shastri, visiting professor to Zimbabwe University. I'm working with Dr. I.P. Cherin for the last 12 years. And I'm also working with Dr. Kaza Kazadi as a chairman. I'm the uh, right now working as a director to International Institute of Neuroscience, Neurosurgery, Orthopedics and all. Uh, and uh, I've been working more likely with neuro rehabilitation, and the best part is that I have given 35 years to this subject. Well, and you had lots of credentials, but I think you are as well bringing a personal story here. It's not just your scientific side and academic side that makes you a good person, uh, expert to talk about this subject, but as well your personal experience. Tell us about it. Uh, yeah, the most important part I will tell you is that in my 42 years of my life, I spent six months in coma. That is so... And I suffered. And uh, it is uh, like uh, each coma period was more than 25 to 30 days. Each coma period was GCS3. The chances of survival was only 2%, maybe vegetative stage. And from that vegetative stage, the moment I'm discharged from the ICU, I have joined my duty on the third day. So what was the background? Being deficit. What was the medical yeah. condition that you went under coma? It is ARDS okay. or cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac arrest. Because I have a habit of working 24 hours to 72 hours and I keep pulling to 96 hours. Because uh, once you enjoy one heart attack, you like to enjoy the other one. <laughs> <laughs> you see, I love how you're content. You know, people usually they wallow yeah. in their misery. When they, are, they just want to, everybody know they're miserable, but you're turning your serious medical condition to a life experience. You are cherishing being alive. Being alive has many facets and you're so beautifully are content and cherishing those downside of life. So, but the, yeah, there are lots of stories there that we are uh, eager to hear. Uh, tell us about this. What what did it so, feel? Before go before going to this video, can I show you an Indian video where yeah. you will see the powerful of the mind. How Indian yogis at 1000 degrees centigrade they have walked to uh, minus 40 degrees centigrade. How they have lived 40 years without food and it is medically proven. And the videos are made by the Harvard University professor. It is 5 minutes video and the last photo is of mine where you will see me on ECMO with 100% ventilation with GCS3. Yeah. yeah, please share. Wow. Don't have a sound, but we see somebody in the Himalaya in snow. Unclothed. Yeah, uh, or naked, walking with the, just the underpant. And I can't tell you. Are you audible? Are yes. you audible? We don't no, hear no. the we don't hear the voice, but we are able to see that, which is quite impressive. Ah, uh, one minute. Ah, uh, sir, this is the oil bomb. He's not able to hear. So now we see a monk praying in yeah a cauldron of boiling oil with lit fire underneath. Yeah, and I can just tell you that uh, these are conditions that. Um, uh, yes, sir. The temperature is more than 1,000 degrees centigrade. And he's sweating, but he's not showing any pain or any... Yeah, so the, no pain. Yeah. yeah, it does it's, it's not show any sign of discomfort. That sort of remind me as well of that monk that in Vietnam put himself on fire, just content. That's amazing. Is it kind of like a ritual? I see there's some other people there. Yes. Yeah, it's a ritual. Mm -hmm. And was it, what is it that they're holding? Uh, it's a monk who's uh, offering prayers. Okay. And the temperature right now is more than 1,500 degrees centigrade. Mm-hmm. And there is no burn injuries. Wow. Definitely takes a lot of meditation.
both of them are very impressive as well. Um, as somebody who lives in Minnesota knows what cold is, and uh, the, just the idea of, of when the first monk that is naked under snow in Himalaya, which is extremely... This is another Rambau. It's, you can see he's sitting on the fire, but it's not burnt. The temperature is more than 1000 degrees centigrade. The video was made by a Howard University professor. Wow. Mm -hmm. Very impressive. So can you hear this video voice? No, we see the videos, but we have no um we may have no sound. It's not hearing but, the voice, no sound. But 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 this is we see that. We see what it's is just, going yeah, on. Yeah, sir. There. So you can see his clothes are not burning. Now you see the temperature is more than around one thousand degrees centigrade. It's a very yeah. heavy fire. I see a lot, yeah, definitely a lot of smoke. But yeah, he's not showing now any... the fire will go to the very high extent. Yep. You can see the temperature. Wow. Now, the, even as a child, I have heard about this kind of yogis or uh, uh, the, what are the other names that uh, are attributed to people who have achieved this level of consciousness? What names are you using in India for this kind of... Um, now you see, the, the clothes are not burnt, sir. The already the fire is on the cloth. The cloth is not burning. Even his hair is not burning. Yes, sir. You can see the hairs are also not burning. Now you can see the fire is totally on his body. And there is no burn injury. Wow. That now is you can see. That's and if you extend the video, you will see the fire is totally on his body and it's not burned. Mm. Wow. And then he's laying on kind of like a stone or a cement Maybe the clay Stairs? is a clay fireplace. It's almost like a oh yeah made out of clay. Yeah. I personally witnessed this ritual, sir. Mm -hmm. There's no chemical induced in it. Is a real person? He's only taking one glass of milk and two uh, bananas a day. That's all. From last thirty-five years. Wow, for 35 years, only two bananas a day and a glass of milk. Mm -hmm. And then you see that it's no, his clothes are not burnt, sir. Very wow, that's amazing. He's just getting up. So now they're saying what might be for body temperature. And then you can see again, he's going the fire. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So this is a person called Mataji uh, and, and is in the hospital and uh, he has not eaten food for 50 years and he has made medical food. Wow. Do you know what they're talking about in this clip? He is the director of the hospital, and they have, uh, and he's surviving of uh, without food and water, and uh, he has not passed stool and water for hundred and eight hours. Wow. And he has been closely monitored for 15 years. He's a DIS defense scientist. Okay. Now, certainly with certain level of consciousness and meditation and so on, you can control your vegetative a function in your body and reduce your requirement for um, energy. But this is uh, truly amazing. Uh, how is that even physically possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen the videos of 
the people who slow down their heart rate. So this is me. Is it GCS three with ECMO mm. and a ventilator, hundred liters? Wow. This is my sixth, seventh ICU admission with twenty five days. Seventh mm. in twenty five days. Wow. Yeah, I was totally GCS three. Uh, when I was admitted, my I was told I was my heartbeat was around uh, less than thirty, mm -hmm. and uh, saturation was less than nine percent. So for people who don't understand the GCS, it's so-called Glasgow Coma Scale. It is a level of bodily function that is here practically standardized way of neurosurgeon or in neurology, how we assess somebody who has an altered mental status. It goes from highest is 15. It is based on how you talk. If you're able to respond with words, if you're able to open the eyes, and if you're able to follow commands, practically GCS3 means there's no bodily function whatsoever. That is the lowest level of the um, consciousness or bodily in coma. Practically the lowest number is three. Is, there is no zero. Three is the lowest number. Wow. Yeah. And so in this case, my people were dilated. Hmm. They were dilated. That the, and obviously, neurologically dilated pupils are sign of a brainstem, actually, that the, our brainstem is not active. That is the practically at that point, most of people, if it's a sustained injury, that's one of the criteria, actually, to consider somebody brain dead if the pupils are dilated. I'm sure you, uh, our viewers have seen that in movies and so on that, you know, to talk about dilated pupil because uh, the dilated pupils are truly a, a severe sign of brain injury. I just wanted you to tell us about, now just before we joined the podcast together, you said you enjoyed your coma. <laughs> yes, sir. It was, it was such a beautiful life. Uh, if you ask me, Sasriji, what is the next thing I would like to go? I say, you put me back to coma. I <laughs> like to go back to ventilator. You put succorin and all uh, medication and you put me on ventilator. Uh, even I enjoy these days. Uh, usually I take around, uh, after every six months, I go on mechanical ventilation. I go to my friend's ICU. They put me on uh, coma stage. They put on syringe pump, ventilator. And uh, with uh, ventilator, I'm on coma for six, seven days. And I enjoy that part. Uh, I do those things even now. So if you see that, uh, I love to go to coma again and again. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So we, one thing you said is that you enjoyed seven heart attacks. Can you tell us a little bit about like what it felt, how you felt when you had your first heart attack? Because they, I think the star subject is near death experience. So yeah, please, I want to know that too. Uh, yeah. So the question was that, when my first heart attack was there, uh, I was in the hospital and I was doing non-invasive uh, brain stimulation and I was continuously doing it for 48 hours. So suddenly I had a chest pain and I was I singed. I fell down on the floor and uh, I went unconscious. And then I saw people are giving me CPR, they are giving noradrenaline and I was able to see. And suddenly a light appeared and I in, in, involved in that white light. And then it took me to a beautiful place, which I have never seen in my life. And it was like a beautiful fragrance. And so many people, um, so many divine things were there. I felt that it is no use of going. But after 10 minutes, a person appears in a very divine light. He says, you have to go back. The duty is not over. And he says, please go. You have enjoyed this. We wanted you to show this. You have seen it. Now the body has not finished your time. You please go. And when I come back and I see after two days, I'm discharged with everything okay. And you see the heart is flat. Choke is not working. And after five minutes when they declared me death, I come back to life. Wow. So when you said that you saw people giving you CPR, were you seeing that from like a heightened state? Like yeah, I've I have seen that. I've seen that. And after that, I've gone to the white light. I've okay. seen the people and I have heard them giving me noradrenaline, dopamine. I have heard all these things. And even I have seen the flat line 
and they have declared me death. When I heard that I am death, I thought, and suddenly a white light appeared. A tunnel appeared and I went inside that tunnel. Automatically you are attracted to a tunnel and there is a white light. And that white light is such a beautiful light. And then you go to a beautiful fragrance which you cannot express. And then there is a divine everything, a divine music, a divine rhythm. And then you feel everything is so peaceful, so you feel that the entire cosmos of the world is inside you. And then you realize that you are living mundane activities of the world. Now we see, when I come back, I always see what we are living and when we are dying, I see death is better than life because it's real enjoyment. It's such a big enjoyment which I felt that I always feel if you send me to coma, uh, I raise my hand, sir, please send me to coma right now. <laughs> I've actually I've heard that a lot. I've I've read a lot about near death experiences. Mm -hmm. I think I have like two or three books, like physical books about it. And most of the people that I've read about having these experiences say the same thing that if they could, they would like to go back. They they actually had a hard time coming back to earth or like coming Yeah, back. right. Is that how you felt? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the could... world is so nice there. The beauty of that world is so nice. Actually, everything what we have written in the books mm -hmm. about the after death experience, I believe seventy percent is wrongly depicted. Interesting. The life after death is very beautiful. You enjoy that life so much that you don't want to come back to life. <laughs> I believe that. Really. No, I, I can tell that most of people live their life being scared of death. Yeah, I think many. Horrible things happen in our lives because we are so scared of the end of life, which is the death. And I think uh, the, what you guys are describing, this near-death experience and the beautiful feeling that uh, it comes, that that's uh, there's something afterward that uh, gives you the confidence that uh, you will be taken care of. That can, once you remove the fear of death, I think you can live so truly freely. That's truly amazing. The most important part is that you meet so many nice prophets and so many nice people. You have a very divine conversation. I I remember after my this heart attack when my GCS was two or three and already it was declared that I'll be on the vegetative stage because my saturation on admission was nine. It was not 95 or 96 or 85. My oxygen level was nine. And uh, my lung was totally prolapsed. I was on ECMO for seven or nine days. And uh, I was already on neuroblockers, neuromuscular blocker, fentanyl, metazonam. And there were six syringe pumps were induced in me. And uh, noradrenaline was given after every half an hour. And those conversations I can see, I have seen that. And again, I have gone to the white light. It was like a journey coming back. And then I was thinking I should go back there. And then again, I said, no, I requested that white light. I want to go back out. So I got chance. I could have come out from coma in five days also. But that white light was so attractive that I said, I want to enjoy that white light than this mundane activities of the world. And I requested that person who was there with me, was my mentor. I said, sir, please let me spend some more time. He said, okay. But you have to go back. That is the promise you have to give me. <laughs> I said, okay, but let me enjoy my word with you. And each time I found the same person. Yeah. And then the most important thing he narrated me about Quran was Allah has created everything for you. You did not enjoy it. Now you see Allah has taken care of you on this earth also and after your life also. You see the beauty of Allah. You, you Now you see, you want to go back to life? He asked me. I said, no. You just come in at my body. I don't want to go back. This is something which I don't want. But then he said, you have to work for the world. You have to work. You have to work for the deficits. And then, you know, I was inspired to work on non-invasive brain stimulation. Suddenly a person came and he told me by inserting needles here. He taught me what is brain mapping. And imagine when I came out of coma, I understood what is brain mapping. I've learned so many things in coma that without being a spine surgeon and a neurosurgeon, 
I can perform surgeries. <laughs> What was the last time you had this uh, experience? When was it? Like in years or months? It is just nine months back, sir. You nine can months. see the trickers from me over here. Wow. You can very... see the trickers to me. Yeah, my, we do. We do, actually. Yeah. yeah. Wow. We do. Now, uh, I can't you just... can see a uh, center line over here mm -hmm. and center line over here. Yeah. We wow. do see that. Yeah. Now, Uh, considering that you are so short after this uh, near-death experience, I, I love your energy and your vitalism, I would call yeah, it. So, they, they, so I, I would say most of people after a traumatic experience, they're just struggling to get over it, whereas you have accepted it so beautifully. And not only that, I think uh, you are giving a lot of people a uh, 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 a reason and a motivation to just be content we accept if they have, are in a bad medical situation and uh, that accept that even in that kind of situation you can be vital you can be positive you can be um, overcome you overcome the disease practically with this attitude true. mind over power it doesn't become more obvious than this so true Yes, sir. I, in genetic care and in cancer care, I'm a counselor. So whenever people are about to die, they call me as a spiritual teacher in India. So I'm called a Swamiji. Rightfully. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, because... If my family member yeah, was pass, there's no one I would rather that they talk to than someone like you who's experienced it. Because I think that that would give the family a lot of peace knowing even when their loved one does pass away, they'll still be... in a really good place. Let's talk about yeah, why I, are people scared of death? I think I that is kind of you know, the counterpoint to the to the to this what we consider death to be this horrific things that ends everything. In I mean obviously culture it's a cultural thing as well. But why are people so scared of death? Were you afraid of death before your experiences? No. Death is nothing. It's the death of ego only. Yeah, you, true. There is nothing. Only there is a death of ego. We always correct all glutters in our mind. We think all this is ours. But when we see the beautiful world of the other side, you understand, this is nothing. We are just wasting our time. Mm -hmm. If we use this time for the prosperity of what is written in Quran, I tell you, sir, and honestly, I've written a book My seven, eight heart attack, and I'm preparing myself for the twelfth heart attack. You've read a book? Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, your... I'm very sure. I'm very sure. I'm going to have ninth heart attack after maybe three or four months. Oh no! What makes you say that? <laughs> Because already I have experienced cardiac arrhythmia and all. I have experienced, and you can understand that uh, maybe after three or four months, you get that experience that yes, after four months, uh, already in divine way you will know that. You are going to have a heart attack after four months. And again, I'm going to come back. And I I tell you, sir, I really enjoy my heart attacks. <laughs> and I, I want that every sometime I should go to ARDS. I should go to a heart attack. I should go to coma. And when you come out from coma, you really enjoy the ICU. Wow. <laughs> It's like a five-star hotel. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I wish I could bottle your attitude in small little bottles. replicate it and just go to any random hospital in the United States and just give it to oh my gosh if, if you could if you could take that attitude and spray him. yeah if you could just take that attitude imagine how much you know this uh, anything here at the end of the day is our attitude toward things that makes our environment our our, our life Oh, I say that all the time. Yeah, and you know, imagine if you could have this kind of attitude toward your disease, uh, toward your um, down, what we consider here in West, and, uh, invest the downside of life, you know, disease, um, death, uh, misfortune, and so on. But I think you are lucky to come from a culture that this culture cherish all ups and downs of life. I think that has, I do believe that that's a lot to do with the Hinduism, Buddhism background of the culture that 
that it, it is more about the background from Quran. It is more because I have written a book on neurobiology of Allah. So there is a Sai Imam who asked me, what do you understand by Allah? So when I was after that, the Prophet asked me, uh, you may go about the story of Meher Baba. He's a very big saint in India. You will see in Google. So mm -hmm. you can YouTube him. No, so tell I met us someone the story. like I want, I want to hear that story. Yeah. Tell us the yeah. story. There's a book of Sounds of Silence. That book I read. And that after that, they came back to the contact of his mother. And that the mother has uh, contacted with uh, their, uh, their family members. And he told them, there is a ring, there is this, there is this, there is this. And then he brought them in touch with Meher Baba. So when I went in this contact, I also was brought to one saint like him. And I had a conversation one to one. I remember that conversation very well. So he asked me, what do you understand by Allah? What do you, how do you define Allah? That was the question he asked me. And then I said, for a while I also remembered that word and the divine experience, having that conversation with him. I asked him, who are you? He said to me, whom do you think I am? I said, I think you are someone whom I cannot define. Because definition is given to a person which can be defined. I think you are not a definition. So he asked me, now what do you mean by Allah? I said, there is no prefix and there is no suffix. Allah only knows what he is. The one who has created the entire cosmos who takes care of even me after that, who is so much bothered about my body also and is making me enjoying my body as well as my death. I've enjoyed two things at the same time. I have seen my death also. I have seen my life also. And I have seen my post-recovery also. Now, if you see, I was the same person who used to enjoy 17 cars. I had a luxury of my life. And now I enjoy with only one shirt and pant. It has changed my way of thinking of life. It has made me walk like 96 hours. I can walk continuously. 108 hours if you make me walk. I don't feel to sleep. Even if you give me two doses of fentanyl and two doses if you compound with cocktail and you will see it does not affect my body. You give me propofol combined with fentanyl, metazola, socoli and after 20 minutes you will see I am walking up and I am doing my work without any indigenous hallucination, nothing. I'm perfectly talking to you. Yeah, I think it, it, we know of uh, lots of people who can truly control their bodily function and- Like we saw earlier. Yeah, and as well, no, but as well in, in the many other ways that you know, that what you're describing is uh, for Western audience is uh, something that we are not used to. Yeah. Because, we think that the solution for everything is a medication, is a procedure, is a we are so um, practically um, slaved to our technology that we don't know um, how to live without it or how to do without it. But then we see that uh, all of a sudden there are people, especially in other cultures, especially when they don't have access to all this uh, you know, technology, that they can control their blood pressure, they control their blood sugar. And this is truly something that we have shown that we here in West, we consider it impossible. I mean, how can you control your own blood pressure? But they have done those studies here by right yes, amount even, of... Even, yeah, even I will show you my eyes. Uh, I have also brought my heartbeat to 18 or 20. Mm. Wow. Uh, by controlling your breathing, at certain moments of life, you will have influence and you can control it. And at that time, a divine light will appear to you and you just become unconscious. We call it Samadhi. And then again, you have a conversation with the divine people. And that conversation is very beautiful. I have written those notes with you that not be living life for what purpose? The purpose of living life is to go to a better life. And what we have done, we have involved ourselves so much in our material world that we forgot the purpose of life is to give a better life to ourselves. We have become external more than internal. No, I we found like happiness outside. 
Yeah, I would like to ask you when you and you have this, you say you are looking forward to this divine conversation. If it's not too personal, can you describe to me how that divine conversation sounded? How how was that? What was the subject? What was the conversation of that divine conversation? Yes, describe. Sir. It was a very because when I went to the white light, first came the black light. I crossed the tunnel and then appeared a white light. So when white light came to me, I was suddenly absorbed in that white light. And then it moved to me a new person. And that person, he suddenly appeared with me. And before that, it was a very beautiful fragrance. I've never smelled that fragrance. Such a beauty it was. I cannot express in any words. The beauty cannot be expressed. Beauty lies in the eyes of the beholder. So I say that if you want to enjoy, you have to go to Koma and enjoy the beauty. <laughs> <laughs> there is no second way of enjoying it. But when you ask about the, the conversation, so the first thing he asked me, what do you understand by Allah? I said, it's a sound. It's a sound which makes you from external to internal. And then it gives you a path to internal journey. That part he explained to me. So when you keep sounding and you become silent, your breathing will go inside you and you will not be externally. And then when you breathe internally, you will find the real joy is your life. We forgot, we found joy in things, but the joy is inside. That is what he explained to me. When I said to him, you are sending me back to the body after enjoying this, can I adjust with the outside world? You said that, yes, you will find so many people, so many good friends, that post coma also you will enjoy. I said, how is that possible? Because I am an orphan. My, my mother, father has died. My brother sister has left me. If I am sick, no one is there to take care. But out of the way, I tell you one experience, personal experience. I have been taken care by these people because sometimes I have an episode of vomiting, 51 episodes of vomiting, and I find someone is taking care next to me. When I'm in coma, when they are doing tracheostomy, and then I feel the pain of the tracheostomy, and when they are doing suction, the pain is very bad of the suction. They go really deep inside and it is very bad. But then suddenly when I feel the pain, I say, ah, and I remember that soul and the pain is gone. And then I start laughing. I say, you do whatever you like. I don't bother. The nurses were offended that we are doing suction. Instead of shouting and abusing, you are laughing. And they called a psychiatrist to give me some Lona Jep and all because they think that I become mad. Because when you do suctioning, and uh, you start writing and you start prescribing medicines after coming out of coma. You started doing your OPD from your chair, coma bed. And they're asking me uh, whether I am well-oriented. I can diagnose the patient. I said, okay, you take me to a wheelchair and I can diagnose a patient. They, they took me to wheelchairs. I was oh, definitely, I was in full conscious. I was writing. In tracheostomy period, I was writing. And they said that this boy is mad. And then they asked me, the other, uh, and uh, out of curiosity, he asked me, what did you see? I told him all the drugs which you have given me. He was amazed. He was saying, how do you know we have given you noradrenaline? Half hourly, we have given you dopamine. We have given you fentanyl. We have given you metazolam. We have given you sacolin. Uh, and you have given me two hourly sacolin. At GCS3, how do you know this? I said, I have seen that. I have seen you were the one you gave me bradycardia. You were the one you gave me this. You were the one you gave me this one. And after coming out of coma, I said, I know all of you. <laughs> and then that happened. When I go here again, I said that I'm coming back with bradycardia. Don't worry. You will be the one <laughs> to take me over. They said, my God, this is the first person because I was the rarest person to survive in this stage. Because after going to ICMO, People don't come out from the vegetative stage because the saturation is 9%. You can understand it is a hypoxic in cell. Mm -hmm. There is no way coming out. The heartbeat is hardly 20 at that time or 18. That means it is a near death. Almost you are dead. Mm -hmm. Now, in this, and from what there, we call, I apologize. In this, what we call out of body experience. Now, were you in one place watching it? Were you floating? How were you experiencing others and yourself when you had this out-of-body experience? 
So actually, when they were doing so many experiences, I did not feel any pain. I was out of my body and I was seeing my heartbeat is 20 because they were saying me GCS3 and I could recall Dr. his Dr. Mithilesh was saying like this. The head of the department was counseling me mm -hmm. and the people called up my relatives and they said, you want to see him for the last time? You may come tomorrow, he may die. Every day, after every two hours, the critical care doctor was saying, we cannot say anything about him. After two hours, he may die. We are putting him on ECMO. After five days, we'll remove the ECMO. If he comes out, okay. Or we'll remove ventilator and he will die. Because for nine days, I'm on GCS3. There is no sign of pain, no sign of improvement. And it was like, I'm coming, I'm seeing my body and I'm again going back. Wow. So it was like coming, going, coming, going. And after that, I experienced them that you told like this, you told like this. Then they were saying, I don't understand. He's a mad boy. <laughs> he, he, he was not in coma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then they say, let us close this topic. He is all right. Just discharge him after 29 days. We have no use of giving him. Otherwise, he will give. Us, he will make us mad. Because at GCS3, how can you tell me what are the drugs we gave you? Yeah. So you the were doses in a, of the drug. You were in a coma for you've been in multiple comas, but one of your comas was 22 days long, correct? This last coma was for 25 days. Before 25. that, 35 days. Yeah, uh, before that, 45 days. One coma was 60 days. When you're in a coma, are were you able to like hear anything from the people around you, see anything? What was that like? Or was each coma yeah. different? Each coma experience was the same thing. I was out of my body because there was very severe pain when they put this mm. injection, the central line and all. The moment they put this in, when there's a neuromuscular block or they give fentanyl and high dose of metazolam, you go to that stage. So at that stage when I went, suddenly I saw the white light. And then they said, I heard saying them, oh, his pulse is 18. We may say he's a tender, he will die after some time. So we should wait till his death. Mm -hmm. And then I told them, this was the nurse who told me, sir, we should stop his oxygen and we should mm -hmm. declare him death. And I said, you and Stephen, you told me like this. Nah? Then they said, sir, how do you know? <laughs> how did you hear? Because you were on papers, you had GCS4. And now you're saying my name. And every time I experience a beautiful life, and that is why I say, what we see on this earth, is different and what you see in the other world is different and when you go to the other world it's more beautiful than this world mm -hmm. i always say people you live a beautiful life in this earth and i tell you allah will take care of you in that world he will is so much bothered about you is so nice with you is so careful with you that you will love to die mm -hmm. so once uh you go to coma you will understand. You The first thing, if I, people ask me, what do you say? I say, I love to die. Or I like to go to coma. <laughs> so how was the transition once you come out of coma or regain what we call consciousness? In I enjoyed sir. You, I would say I, the, five minutes to half an hour. Can you describe what you felt when you were coming back out of coma and near death experience? What do you remember? And I came out of uh, I coma. It was a blood vision. It was the vision was totally blood because I'm a high myopic patient having minus 10. Mm -hmm. But the first thing I asked them, because I was on tracheostomy, I asked them, give me glasses. That's interesting. That's the and first then I said, the first thing I said, I want glasses like this. Mm -hmm. And then I saw my hands. Because I was afraid. I'm on... Uh, uh, because I heard the voice that I'll be vegetative. My hands and legs will not be working. The first thing I saw, my hands are working or not. Because I was worried about my practice. The mm -hmm. first thing I saw, my hands are moving. Then I touched my nose. And then I touched all this uh, neurological signs. I said, see, and give me a pen. I saw the other photos. You see, I am writing. And every day I was writing. And I was diagnosing the patient. I was prescribing medicines. Mm -hmm. And then I said, 
And then the most important part, every time I co come out of coma, because after coming from Karat, again I had a heart attack. Recently, when I met IP Cherry and I came back, I was again for four days in coma. And after every coma, I find a very good person in my life. And this was, I was happy that this coma brought you in my life. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in coma, I meet another angels. After coma, I meet people like you. So if you tell me, and if you, uh, I have written a book that if coma is so beautiful, I should always go in. After every two months, I should have one heart attack. <laughs> because you meet IP Chahir, you meet Ahmed Abbasi. Because of the seven heart attacks, I'm meeting you. So now, if you ask me, what is my experience? I would say it is the same experience, like talking to you and talking to him. And the most beautiful part, I always say to these people, don't be afraid of anything. Don't be having, have a fear of losing everything. The one who is Allah, he takes care of everything. That is why he's called Allah. You do whatever you want, but he will take care of you. First, you have to live a good life in this world. Don't harm anyone. And the other world is more beautiful. You should be prepared for going to other world. Because that world is wants to welcome you. And you will see it's so beautiful, so mm -hmm. joyful. So then, so at that time, I also enjoyed one thing. I wanted to see US, right? I, I wanted to go to Chicago. So I said, okay. I, I told that saint, I want to go to Chicago. You go. I have seen some places there. Mm -hmm. And I memorized some spellings. And I memorized certain hospitals and some spaces. And then I, when I came back, I asked them to give me mobile. And I'm touching my mobile and seeing whether this places uh, really existed or not. And the time I said, in this day, what was my coma status? They said it was GCS4. The day when I was in Chicago, I remember that date. And I asked them in writing, can you see me the case diary? I'm the head of the department of this medical college. Can you can I see my case diary? It is not allowed to be seen. But the nurse said, okay, you can see. And then I saw on that day, I was on GCS4. And when I saw on YouTube, the tube, that this place has really existed, which I did not see. And then I saw Germany. I saw people doing various activities. And then again, I went to the world. And then the person asked me, what did you realize? I said, life is beautiful, both on earth and on the other side. If we live this life beautifully, the other life is also beautiful. If we may live this life in a negative way, other life is also negative. Because you don't enjoy. Even if you get a beautiful world, you will not enjoy. Like today, we have everything, but we want to grave everything. So we don't enjoy this life. There is nothing for not enjoyment. I don't find a reason we don't enjoy. Why can't we enjoy this life what we have? And similarly, when you die, you go to the other world. The mind is there. The body has gone. The mind is there. The pleasure is there. The memories are there. So, when you go to that world, you also don't enjoy that world because you did not enjoy this world. So, enjoyment is inside. So, when you enjoy this world, I am definitely sure, sir, you'll enjoy the other world. And I tell you, when you go to other world, you will say that this is what you really wanted for life. You dreamt for this. And the people over there are so nice. The prophets, the people. I remember there was one prophet, Meher Baba. And another more saint from Iran. There was one saint, I forgot, Rumi. Yeah. Well, I wish that everybody in their life can come to this level of consciousness that death is nothing to be afraid of. And and I think that will help a lot of... Or, or I just like to narrate one thing. I asked Rumi one question. When did you hate Allah? <laughs> that was my question. Because mind is working after that also. She so said, mm -hmm. I love Allah so much that uh, I don't have time to hate him. I said, can you explain me in my language? He said, Allah loved this Satan so much, the devil so much. He was not comfortable here. So he gave him his own word to be 
happy. He cared for the devil also. He cared for the Satan also. So you can see his love for devil also and you can see his love for you. You see, you are in so much pain in the body. But you see, we have brought you here so that you can enjoy your world and when the time comes, you go back to your world and you have no pain. I tell you, sir, post tracheostomy also I have no pain and tracheostomy also I had no pain. They used to put a lot of injections. I used to only laugh and all that period, I used to see one person standing next to me and always doing like this. Nothing to worry. Nothing mm -hmm. to worry. And all these tears used to come down my life. I used to say, I am an orphan. And that person used to say, till I am with you, how you can be orphan. And imagine, my bill was more than uh, $100,000. So it was a heavy bill. But it was considered, I got 50% discount. And I had that money. And he said, you don't worry. Everything is arranged. From your discharge to your work, I've arranged everything. And the last thing he told me before going, you will meet so many nice people in this world. And every heart attack, you will meet a good person. So oh. I thought this, after Karat, when Farah came, he said, Amit Abbasi will like to talk to you. And then I saw your neurosurgeries. I don't know how to talk to you. But then I said to that saint, who I believe my mentor, can you do something by which Amit Abbasi charges so much money? I don't have any money to be his fellow. How can I learn from Hamid Abbasi? He tell me, you don't worry. Hamid Abbasi will talk to you and you will get free fellowship. You will work in his neuro rehab center. You can, uh, you can work, you will learn and he will not charge you anything. And I said to him, how is this possible? His fellowship is one like $50,000. I don't see that money in my life. He said, just wait for five days. It was a conversation six days back with me. Before I spoke to Hamda, the, the link, he said, just wait for five days. You will speak to Hamid Awasi. <laughs> and then again, he told me that you will visit, you will, you will meet him. I said, how to meet him? Then uh, Ms. Bacon came. Then I came to know you are coming. I am your host. I will be going with you in Pune. I will have time with you in Pune. And then I was saying, what is the benefit? He said, the world will be benefited with your meeting. Every meeting in this world is divine. Everything what is happening is pre-planned by Allah. Nothing is overwritten. Everything is pre-written in your life. You and cannot think. Certainly privileged to be there next week totally. and immerse in this very rich culture that uh, create this level of consciousness that you walk on fire, you are cold, you, uh, in the cold, but you don't feel the cold. You're hungry, but you're able to control your bodily function. It's kind of... Sir, we, can, kind of uh, we can make one experiment also. I'll bring three ampoules of fentanyl. You can inject on IV and you can see on me. I think I stay away <laughs> from that. I think I stay... Uh, I could lose my medical license in the United States for I that. Actually, no, I actually... No, no, you don't need to do it. I'll use my medical license. And I'll inject myself and you can check out. <laughs> I have a question before we go, before we end, I have a question. It's a little bit off topic. With mm -hmm. your experiences of af of near death experience or death experience or anything like that, have you ever considered the possibility of us having past lives or like humans living multiple lives throughout a type of our soul living reincarnation are you talking yeah, about reincarnation? reincarnation but with the same soul yes sir yeah i have also seen not only in this i have written books on that uh, especially i was inspired from some howard university professor i can take people in hypnotize and i can go to their previous life and then their previous life and then in my also part i have seen my previous life uh, i was a buddhist monk then before i was a as a surgeon. So that is why before that I was a true Catholic Christian. So when I came to this life, I was behaving like a Catholic priest when I was in Africa. I don't know how I learned all these things. And then before that, I was a true Muslim guy. Mm. And uh, I was a very close associate with a Sufi saint who came all the way from Iran to India. It's called Nijamuddin Aulia. 
Okay. Well, So it's he came from very Iran, amazing yeah. story. It's very amazing story. Um, unfortunately, our podcast time is uh, closing to the end. Yeah, but maybe when we're in but India, sir, you can surprise uh, us. Sir, uh, but I have one humble request. You have been always kind to so many people. And your kindness is just like angelic kindness. No one can... I always see the same prophet's smile, what I see in your smile. So, so most humbly, with deepest gratitude, I most humbly request you to accept me, your fellow. But I have nothing to pay you, sir. It would be my honor. I, that would be my honor. Now, it, it is, we are very excited to be there soon. I know this conversation will continue. Our, unfortunately, our podcast time is coming, closing to an end. So, uh, and, I said, may I request for the stories. recording of the podcast? Uh, podcast recording. And before I leave this podcast, I tell the world, please leave this, enjoy this life and enjoy more after death. Thank you There's so much. There's nothing to be fear of death. You should be happy for that. When the death period comes, you should be very, very happy because you are going to the most beautiful world and you are going to really enjoy it. Most beautiful closing and an encouraging word. Totally. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us from beautiful India. And thank you guys all for watching. I'm Amanda Armagas. I'm Dr. Bossi for Essence and our special guest. MK Shastri, visiting professor with uh, Dr. Kazadi and IP Cherian. Thank you. Uh, you have a good day uh, now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so week. much.